Good morning and welcome to Coffee with Rich. It looks like we are live. And while we we're waiting for folks to jump on, let's go ahead and talk about sponsors. But before I do that, let me introduce myself. My name is Rich Brown. I'm the co-host, co-founder of the American Warrior Society and the American Warrior Show, America's number one self-defense podcast. And today's Coffee with Rich, we're going to be discussing uh, Chad Faulkner, my good friend, and his amazing book, Original Strength for the Tactical Athlete. But let's talk about uh, our number one sponsor, and that is the American Warrior Society and the American Warrior Show. And that is the business I have with my good friend, Mr. Mike Seeklander. And our sponsors for today's show are Century Martial Arts Maker of the Bob XL. And if you hang around to the end of today's show, you're going to hear all of our sponsors read for you. But we also have APPHemp.com, which is Appalachian Standards, my good friends, uh, Jesse and his lovely family growing the best CBD products. Money can buy in the beautiful mountains of Asheville, North Carolina. The Cool Fire Trainer, guys, you've heard me talk about it. If you're watching Coffee with Rich, there's no doubt There's no doubt that you are, uh, you are a shooter. And if you are, you know that ammunition is incredibly expensive. So use the Cool Fire Trainer to take your dry fire to the next level without spending a single dime on ammunition. Mountain Man Medical, as I've said the past couple of weeks, we've got a branded trauma kit coming. And I just got the samples of the vinyl stickers that we're going to be putting on each and every one of those trauma kits. So stay tuned for that. Last but not least, Precision Holsters Makers of the Ultra Appendix Rig and the Tactical Belt, which I am wearing right now to hold up these Vertex pants. But uh, I'd like to thank my good friend, Chad, for coming on the show. But before we get into his bio, let's see. Tony is on from Brunswick, Georgia. John is on from Oklahoma, Yukon, Oklahoma. Good morning. Coin number 1919, my good friend, Will Parker, out there. Coin number 800, and J.D. Helly, my good friend, up in Rhode Island. Coin number 1966. Please like and share. Uh, we got a great show on tap for you today. Will says, hey, Rich and Chad. So uh, I want to read Chad's bio real quick. Chad grew up in West Tennessee and is a retired Army veteran with tours in Haiti, Egypt, Iraq, Afghanistan, and Kuwait. He started as an infantryman in the 82nd Airborne and later served with Army Special Operations and Civil Affairs. He has also spent considerable time as an instructor at the United States Army John F. Kennedy Special Warfare Center. Upon retirement, he moved to East Tennessee, where he trained Department of Energy Security Officers before deciding to pursue his interest in flying helicopters. He is currently rated as a private pilot, pursuing his commercial license at a community college. Chad is also a plank owner of the American Warrior Society and has contributed several uh, articles. And also, Chad is uh, an author, and I've got links to his books in today's show notes. <clears throat> so please check that out. And also, if you want to check out our sponsors, I've made it real simple for you as well. Just go down to the link in today's show notes, and we got deep discounts for all of our amazing sponsors at AmericanWarriorShow.com. Mr. Mike Seekletter is on. He says, good morning, folks. Please like and share. Eric says, Chad. Chris Dyer, Chad Ray. Marley says, hi. All right, please like and hit that share button. And without further ado, good morning, Chad, and welcome to Coffee of the Rich. Good morning, Rich. I got to say hi to, hi to Marley, too. That's my little buddy. Uh, and Eric is my instructor that I'll be flying with whenever I'm done here. And he's waiting for me to get done. Oh, good. So you got a flight this morning? Yeah, yeah. I'll be flying as soon as we're done. I guess I should have mentioned, Chad, also you have a podcast, although you've been a little uh, reticent to put any out in the last little bit, uh, taking the lid off. And I'm sure we'll talk about that at some point in today's show, too. Yeah, yeah, it's it's been it's been tough since I started the uh, the pilot thing, but I'm I'm gonna try, I'm gonna try to get that thing back up and running. I'm I'm looking at some different formats and whatnot to make it a little easier for me to do. Um, so yeah, yeah. So um, and my favorite episode of your podcast, taking the lid off, is the one where I'm a guest on. It's pretty awesome. Yeah, clearly, clearly, that's it's got the least views, but it's the best. <laughs> well, we're gonna see what we can do to fix that. Uh, let's talk about, um, let's see here. Um, let's talk about what did your bio miss? I mean, I read your bio, it's relatively brief, but what does that not encompass, Chad? Um, I don't know. You know, grew up small town, Tennessee, place where everybody knows everybody, that kind of thing. So I, I think that helps explain people sometimes. Start working on a farm up the road for a retired Marine Lieutenant Colonel when I was uh, 13. You know, so I'm sure that was, I, I, 
that was absolutely instrumental in uh in shaping who i am a little bit you know so i've, I've essentially worked since the age of 13 for the most part i uh, had a little time off after retiring but i was still working on my house as you know but uh um, yeah that that's pretty much it there's there's a lot of there's a lot of crap in there i like to say uh in in between those spaces but, but yeah that 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 covers it generally so why did you why did you join the army brother to get out of west tennessee or what well the, i wanted to be in the military I, and i i hate to even admit this but i initially wanted to be a navy seal uh i wanted to be like charlie sheen in the movie you know um he was so cool back in those days but i wanted to be in the navy and, and actually if i remember the, the thing that turned me off there was back then if you joined and you wanted to be a navy seal you had to join the navy and be like a ensign or a cook there was like three jobs that you had to pick from and then you did all that training and then you could apply and go go to seal training and um i didn't want to do any of those other jobs and then i also knew that if you get hurt or anything you go back to that job which was not anything i wanted to do and so i thought well crap i don't you know i've never been tested like that so i don't know you know how that's going to go and i, I didn't want to have a crappy job to fall back on and be stuck in for however many years if that didn't work out. So, um, I don't know the army's, you know, Rambo seemed like the next, <laughs> the next big thing, you know, I was a Rambo fan growing up. So it was like, okay, well, I, I enjoy being out in the woods. I like shooting. So, so let's go do this. And, uh, and, uh, that, that, and my dad was in the army as well. And obviously, you know, him, him being an influence on me. So, uh, dad was in Vietnam. So, um, that that was a lot of it, and I didn't like crayons a lot. You know, they were things didn't <laughs> for me. Oh, Chad, yeah, you know, it's um, I the first recruiter I talked to was was a Navy recruiter. Also, it's funny, it's same same kind of story, but I went in and uh, uh, he had me take the the practice ASVAB, and evidently I scored incredibly well on it because the guys like pushing me toward the Navy nuke program. No, you don't want to do Naval Special Warfare, man. Screw that. You want to do nukes. You want to do nukes. And I'm like, no, sir. I said, no. And uh, he's like, no, no, no. You want to do nukes. And what I didn't know at the time was if he writes a Navy nuke program as a recruiter, it's like writing, you know, four or five contracts. It's a big deal for for those guys. But uh, he wasn't listening, man. And, and thank God, because uh, I don't think I would have had a great time there in the Navy. Yeah, probably I mean, you were kind of in the Navy anyway, right? I mean, how's the men's department, pal? <laughs> hey, okay, let's let's talk about. It. So uh, we talked about why you kind of joined the Army, but what was the? So what did? You, what was your job in the Army? Tell us about that. So I, I I went in the infantry. You know, I think I probably told the recruiter the same thing I just told you, as far as like, hey, I want to run around the woods and shoot guns. And so obviously the option there was was uh, infantry. And so I signed up for the infantry. I, I signed up for uh, for airborne, you know, go jump out of planes and whatnot. And um, that was it. And I, I went in and, and did that. Loved it. Switched over to Special Operations Civil Affairs about halfway through my career and uh, finished out finished out in that. And, and uh, you know, I, I, I love the infantry. I just I kind of kind of got to a point where I'd done everything just about there was to do, you know. What was your job in the infantry? Well, so, you know, I did all the jobs in a normal squad that you have in a line squad, rifleman, grenadier, saw gunner. I think the only thing I probably wasn't was an actual machine gunner. Uh, I've, I'm not a very physically imposing guy. I never have been. And, and, you know, typically those are the guys that you pick for to be your, your gunners. I was a weapon squad leader in charge of the machine gunners at one point, but I was, you know, team leader, squad leader, did some platoon star time. I was a sniper and scouts for a while. Um, this, you know, battalion scout platoon did that as well, you know, and, and I, so I pretty much had covered all the, all the bases from a platoon level anyway. Uh, didn't do anything above that really other than scout platoon. But. Yeah. Robert is on this morning. Jerry is on this morning. Dan from flowery ranch, Georgia. Mark says, good morning, boys. Rudy is on. Good morning, sir. 
Jason is on, says, always wondered where you ended up after the Red Cross days. Nice hearing your voice again. Good morning, Jason. Yeah, man. Uh, Red Cross was a good time. I worked with some amazing people, but uh, about put me in an early grave. It's a lot of hard work over there. <laughs> and the Red Cross, I tell you, they're amazing people doing some incredible things. Alan Kelly says, good morning. Coin number 1571, listening on the way back to Southwest Virginia. Good morning, Alan. So, um, so why did you choose to go soft? Was that a, just an obvious thing once you kind of did everything in the infantry or was there something else driving that decision? Well, soft was probably always the goal. You know, I just, I, even then and now I'm, I'm never a person that sits still well and like, okay, I did this. Now let me go do this. You know, always looking for that higher, higher thing. And I guess we should explain soft for those that don't know that acronym, Chad. Yeah, Special Operations Forces. So, you know, in the Army, it's United States Army Special Operations and then, you know, the Marines, Marine Special Operations. So soft just encompasses all of Special Operations Forces. And then, you know, you got USOCOM, United States Special Operations Command. But um, when I switched over there, honestly, the, the main driving factor was the priority. I was a single parent at the time and, and the priority of my life was my daughter. And I had had a, a fellow squad leader from my time in the 82nd and then a platoon sergeant from my time in the 82nd. Both had switched over to civil affairs. And I was having a tough time as a single parent in the 82nd. It's just not, it's, it's not an environment that's conducive to being a single parent. Um, they could really care less about your family, honestly, you know, uh, and so there were some things that happened there that was like, hey, I, I've, I've got to get out of here. And obviously the special operations environment is much more family friendly, although you're a little busier, more deployed. They do care about your family and it's more of a big boy environment, I guess. And, and so it allowed me an opportunity to go over there. And, you know, when when my daughter is sick, I can stay home with her and it's not a big deal. I can call in and say, hey, she's sick. I, you know. I got to stay with her today. And it wasn't a life changing event. Whereas in the 82nd, you know, if my daughter was sick and I needed to stay home with her or whatever, it was like, uh, yeah, you need to get your family care plan in order. And somebody needs to watch, even though you could have absolutely nothing going on that day. It didn't matter. Your family was not the priority. You need to be here at work, despite the fact you're going to sit on your butt all day. Like I said, versus special operations, it's more like, all right, dude, take care of your stuff, you know? But yeah, that's, yeah what, that's what drove it. And, um, you know, it was once I found out more about it, it was cool. At the time when I switched over, Civil Affairs was recruiting uh, infantrymen with all of their with at least two years of squad leader time in the infantry and then combat engineers. And the rest of them were all uh, Green Berets. And and that's changed now, though. Now in Civil Affairs, it, it allow they allow just about any job to come over in their heart basically no more green berets there yeah and we'll talk more into the civil affairs uh, and some of your deployments there in the middle east but t tell us about one of the things that i've seen a video or two uh, of you floating around the interwebs of you patrolling the streets of new orleans man tell us tell us how that ended up happening what were you doing locked and loaded on the streets of new orleans well so you, you know you had hurricane katrina come around and uh, funny enough, man, so this is one of the things that I, I love about our military, the 82nd Airborne, the guys that I worked with and everything. We had been to Afghanistan. We came back from Afghanistan. Three months later, we're in Iraq. We come back from Iraq. And just a matter of a short time later, we're in New Orleans walking around, you know, and, and we... And, and the, the, the ability of the guys to adapt to any environment, you know, and, and not just be in New Orleans acting like straight killers, you know, from what we had done in, in our on our other deployments. It, it just shows the, the diversity of our of our armed forces. But but while we were there, you know, you had a hurricane Katrina come through. It happened that, you know, everything was in chaos. They were talking about, you know, shootings. The, the big thing that that we heard as far as why we were going was there was a lot of civil unrest and, you know, we were being told that like power line workers and people trying to get systems back in place were getting shot at and things like that. And so we were going to go down there and, and help 
help get get some order and we got sent down there it was uh it was chaos it was it was absolute chaos i I don't know how much people know about what took place down there but but you had every organization and acronym from the government was there and nobody was in control uh and it, it, it was just it was absolute chaos nobody knew what to do i had friends i had friends that went down there to help out guys that were ems workers firefighters that sort of thing had had gone down there and got permission went down there to help out and they turned around and left because they had they had no idea what to do um and there were so many people down there in that same in that same uh feeling or whatever that they just they didn't know what to do because there was nobody nobody running things um and honestly we we were down there a lot of what we did was a was a pr stunt like they had us they had us patrolling the French quarter and there wasn't really a whole lot going on there, but what was there was all the cameras and we were ordered to wear our, our maroon berets. You know, we were ordered. There was one point where we, we hated the cameras. You felt like a celebrity. You'd have cameras all in your faces and everything following you. I turned around, I've got a camera pointing up at my butt. It seemed like, I'm like, dude, what are you filming right now? You know, like they're getting all these crazy angles on you. And uh, and we would start going around the cameras and going into the French Quarter uh, from a different angle so that the cameras would miss us. And our chain of command came down and, and told us, no, we had to walk down Canal Street there at the French Quarter and, and made us walk down through there so that all the cameras would see us. And, and I, I don't want to I don't have a misconception. We, we did some good there, but. Um, people above us were more concerned with a, a PR opportunity, but it was a lot of, it was just, we were patrolling. We were, we were trying to keep crime down, you know, that sort of thing, but we, we didn't have any authority, you know, we're, we're federal troops. So, and we, we just, we couldn't do anything. We started out, I think we talked yesterday. We, we started out, we had magazines in our weapons with like five rounds in them. And then they made us take the magazines out and put them in our pocket. We weren't even allowed to have magazines in our weapons. We didn't take any automatic weapons with us, which was probably a good thing, you know, because if if something would have started, if something would have kicked off and people would have actually shot at us, which did, didn't happen, you know, we, we would have done some damage. Uh, so, but I had a, I actually had a kind of a funny story. We had a, we had an M14 in the company and because I was a trained sniper. Uh, they had me take the M14. My first arm wanted me to take it, but we didn't have any ammo for it. They only gave us five, five, six. And, and I was like, well, we can figure that out when we get there. You know, if it's, if it's needed, we'll, I'll make it happen. And so we get there and I see this, uh, I, I if I remember right, I think he was a FBI guy or he was a marshal. He, I think he was a marshal and and I went up to him and I was just like, Hey man, have y'all got any, uh, 762, any 308 or whatever? And, uh, he's like, yeah, man. He takes me over to his trunk of his car. He's like, yeah, I've, I've got some, man. What do you need? He's like, Oh, hold on. And I hear him get on the radio and he's calling the airport back to an ASP they had set up. And he was about to fly in a, a pallet of, of 762. And I was like, I was like, uh, nah, bro, man, I'm just talking about like a few rounds. <laughs> like don't get me you're about to get me in jail you know and uh and so he goes to the he gets in his trunk and he pulls out a a box of like 308 hunter like core lock hunting ammunition and i was like ah whatever i'll make it work and nice I never, never had to use it but no but, but I, I got it yeah uh gerald says what did you think about taking firearms from civilians we did not take firearms from civilians we're, we're not allowed to take firearms from civilians it, not, so, so understand too. The National Guard was there as well. The Louisiana National Guard was there. I think some other states had sent in some of their National Guard. I honestly do not know what all they did, but I know that you know, National Guard has more authorities than federal troops do. Uh, the National Guard was actually allowed to make people leave and that sort of thing. For us, we would go around and we would just present people the opportunity to leave and say, hey. You know, we can help you get from here to, you know, I think it was the convention center where they were moving people out of and things like that. But we couldn't make anybody do anything, which I think was to our benefit because we were just nice about it. We we're like, hey, we're 
we can't make you leave. You know, we can't make you do anything, but you know, it's not a good situation here. Well, we were helping people get water, you know, uh, we were directing people to where to get food. We were just trying to help and, and they loved us down there. They hated a lot of the people that were down there. A lot of the different agencies that were down there because they were just, they were mean to them, you know, mean to them. That, yeah. Um, but we were just, I mean, we were strictly there to help and that was the attitude that we had. And, and by the time we left, they, there was people in the French Corps that had signs hanging up. We love the 82nd Airborne, you know, that, that sort of thing. So, uh, so it, it was a good opportunity to go down there and, and, and try to help out. And, you know, there was, there was shooting, but not, not ever where we were. I, I talked to a, there was a gentleman, he, he owned a jazz club there and he was still there and, and we were trolling one night and I stopped and talked with him. And I asked him, I said, Hey man, we were told about all this shooting going on and stuff down here. And we haven't, we haven't seen or, or heard any of that. And, and he said, yeah, since y'all got here, <laughs> you know, so, so he said even the night before there was, I guess, gangs coming in and whatnot and, and just shooting at each other or shooting at locals or whatever. I, I don't, I don't know, honestly. Um, but he said, yeah, as soon as y'all got here, I was like, well, yeah, it, it makes, it makes sense. You got a bunch of army dudes patrols. We, we had a, we had a constant presence there. Um, the other thing was you, you had, you had some interesting, so when you hear things like us taking weapons, there's rumors that come up every year about us taking weapons, us arresting people, all this stuff. And, and we did none of that. And, and I'll put this into context for you. The people that were left down there that would have said these kind of things, a lot of them were mentally unhealthy. Uh, I, ha I had people come up to me and tell me that they had seen the marshals or somebody to that effect come in and shoot people and then pick the bullets out of them and leave so that they couldn't be found. You know, uh, they were telling us also that cops were going in and hitting ATMs, uh, in some of those different businesses and we saw ATMs that were busted open and all. And so the, that's, that's maybe partially true. You know, the, the law enforcement, they were told they were going in and, and securing that money uh, to keep it from being looted. But also, I, you know, were they being completely honest with it? I, I don't know. Were they, were they doing what they needed to? I don't know. But we, we had, a, we had people telling us all kinds of stories about people being executed in the streets and everything. Was it true? I, I don't know. It obviously wasn't taking place around us, but. Well, you know, societal breakdown, it's, it's a great time to settle old scores. I mean, we see it not just in, in other parts of the world, whether it's the Balkans or the Middle East, but uh, it, I'm sure it happened in Katrina as well, whether between gangs or whomever, right? Yeah. I mean, you, it's, it's a, it's a, it's a wild environment. You know, you, you've got to think about if, if we get to that level, that was a good example of, what a what a kind of a pop almost apocalyptic type environment would look like flooded you know because because you had people people killing each other you know the there's all the stories about the convention center and people killing each other uh you know there was bodies floating in the water bodies tied to telephone poles so they wouldn't float away you know and and some of these, you know, may or may not have had gunshot wounds. We, we discovered a, we discovered a, um, uh, a healthcare center there for, for older folks. I want to say old folks home that, that still had a lot of people in it where, you know, the staff fled and left, left people behind and they died where they lay. So, you know, it's just a lot to think about. It's a lot to think about with regard to what if that happens here? What if it happens where you're at? You know, maybe not the flood, but, you know, something similar to the pandemic. You, you could be looking at the same kind of situation. And I mean, even with the gas shortages now, you've got people fighting each other at gas stations and those sorts of things. So you got to be prepared to take care of them and protect yourself um, and don't wait on the government like us to, to come help you out. Yeah, exactly. I want to dig more into that, Chad. Uh, Matt is on, says coin number 1985. Good morning, Matt. Guile from the Philippines says, sounds like anarchy. Yeah, absolutely. Paul is on from Naples, Florida. Walt says, good morning. Sorry I'm late, Walt. We're just happy that you're here. And um, 
in that environment, you know, there was a, a case where uh, several patients, I can't remember the number, were euthanized by the by the by a nurse and a doctor because nobody was coming to help. So they, you know, maybe humanely euthanized these people and fled. I mean, it. And, I mean, we could also call that murder. Um, yeah. because they had no legal justification to do that. But in those horrible uh, times, and I, I don't think that's why the, neither one of them, the doctor or the nurse, were ever prosecuted. Um, so in thinking back to your time in New Orleans, you know, before I get there, because I want to ask you, Chad, about lessons learned and what can an armed, prepared individual take away from some of your experiences there in Katrina. But I also want to say that one of the things about disasters we used to say when I was with the Red Cross is all disasters local. And what that meant is like Katrina, it's a localized disaster, even though it encompassed thousands of miles, it was still relatively local. You could ship in relief workers from other parts of the country. You could ship in aid and supplies. But what if the entire nation or the entire world is undergoing like the pandemic, for example, imagine if the, the death toll for COVID wasn't, a percentage of 1%, but 20% or 10%. I mean, it would be horrific and there would be nowhere to go to get out of the way like you could with Katrina. So having said that, Chad, what are some of the lessons that you personally took away from that, your time there? Well, you know, I mean, it's very general to say, but just be prepared, you know, have, have your backup, have your food stores was a big thing, you know, and, and, if it's, if it's going to be a situation like that, where, you know, something happens like that and, and it's sudden and there's things that you don't have and you need, maybe you go get, well, one thing that I did definitely take away was the food is going to be left over in the stores. We saw, we saw plenty of store, you know, like grocery type stores and corner stores that they were looted of TVs, electronics, sneakers all that stuff but they still had food rotting on the shelves uh you know fresh food and all that so you know uh i would tell you that some of that stuff is going to be available if you really go need it however those environments because i saw some of those looting environments they're not safe environments so you don't need you you shouldn't ever plan for well if this happens i'll just go and everybody's looting i'll go and i'll get the stuff that everybody's leaving behind because honestly, that was one of my initial thoughts when I was down there was like, well, crap, I'll, you know, I'll be able to get plenty of food if this ever happens where I'm at because people just leave it behind. However, you know, that's just not, like I said, that's not a safe environment. Um, what if you were rolling four deep with a bunch of other armed dudes? I mean, seriously, you think that would be. I, you could make it happen, but, you know, the thing about that is you, my policy on self-defense has always been you win a hundred percent of the fights that you're not in here, here, you know, so it wouldn't be wise to, to be in that situation. Now, if you absolutely had to, I, I'll tell you where I would do that is a medical situation. If I ran into a situation where I've got a, a kid who's diabetic or a grandpa, you know, somebody who's diabetic or whatever the case may be. And there's medication that I know that may not be available for a while for what's gone down then then I will take on a fight um, because that's potentially life saving, you know. So, it, you know, the thing you got to remember with the it doesn't matter how many guns or how much training you've ever done. If you put yourself in a situation where you may get in a gunfight, it doesn't matter how good you are. The bullets are pretty indiscriminate and you can die no matter how much training you've had. So, well, and where's the healthcare infrastructure too, in an apocalyptic kind of thing like Katrina, I mean, okay, let's say you are gunshot and you're wading through this sewage water. I mean, and you're, you get a really nasty infection. The, you, you know, I mean, your point is well made and well taken, I think. Yeah. You know, and, and that's a, that's a whole other topic that I, that gets me just uh, fuming at times is how many people have guns compared to how many people have tourniquets. Yeah. You know, there's, there's a ton of people out there that, that preach, Oh, I'm, 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 I carry a gun. I carry this and that, but they, they don't have a fire extinguisher in their house. They don't have a tourniquet on their part, you know, anywhere near them. Don't know how to make a field expedient tourniquet, um, you know, any of those kind of things. So that medical piece is, is huge. And it's, it's, it's really just like the self-defense piece you need to protect yourself. You need to be able to take care of yourself. 
Well, that medical piece is part of that. Yeah. And we had somebody on recently and I apologize. I can't remember who the guest was, but he said, you know, you can't shoot a heart attack in face, you know, so taking yeah. care of your physical health. And I know that we'll talk later about your book, original strength for the tactical athlete, because I think that it, the approach that you have in that book is something that anybody can do of any age and, and stuff. So I want to, we'll talk about that in a second. Kathleen says, please don't let me cry. So sad. Same with Hurricane Ike on the island, coin number uh, 2013. And Chris says, Katrina was hot, human, nasty, and the press was everywhere. Yeah, Chris was one of my dudes. He was there. Oh, yeah. And Guile says, uh, and Guile uh, in the Philippines is a medical professional. Guile says, I couldn't do that, Rich. Taking another life to save my own, I cannot live with that. I'd rather stay with my patients to the end. I'm sure the people that I love will understand why I stayed. And uh, I respect the hell out of that. And uh, that's an amazing thing. And one of the things was, you know, when the power goes out, the backup generators fail. You're sitting there in the dark with people that are slowly dying because they don't have oxygen. They don't have the, you know, the, the, all the machines that support and facilitate life suddenly are not there. And you're just going to watch yeah. these people. A lot of them just die slowly agonizing. It's horrible. Yeah, that. I'll, I'll tell you that that scene of the the nursing home or whatever it was that I went in. I think it was a nursing home that I went into. There was a you know, it, it that was you want to talk about PTSD like that'll give you nightmares. I actually I didn't let I didn't let anybody else go in once we me and I think one or one or two of my guys maybe went in there uh, when we were walking around and then I didn't let anybody else go in because it just you know there was nothing to do there and I mean you're talking. The emergency lights were flashing, the emergency, there was a buzzer buzzing, and you got these rooms with people, you know, who were either still in their beds or had made their way out of their bed and died where they were. And that's a, that's a terrible scene, you know, that'll, that'll make you think, make you think hard about stuff. Yeah, and uh, the particular one that uh, has had some press about it, the, uh, the euthanizing, the only reason that they figured out that these people uh, were killed was one of the uh, one of the people had went in. He was a healthy man in like his thirties. He went in for like an appendectomy. Katrina hits, but he's still healthy. I think he's texting his family, and the next thing you know, he's dead. I'm like, wait a minute, how did this happen? You know, and oh, he's laying there with a row of other dead people. Hmm. And then they start doing toxicology and find that they've been given a, a lethal dose of, uh, I can't remember what it was that they, they injected them with, but you know, those are hard times and I don't want to, I don't want to money morning quarterback what it must've been like for those, uh, those people. But you know, anything else you mentioned food storage is of course, that's a, that's a great point. You mentioned medical supplies, anything else that the armed citizen can take away from that? You know, we tend to focus on the, on the negative, but really there was a lot of positive too. You, you got to think there is a societal breakdown, but, but people are still people and there's a lot of good people out there. And, and I saw people helping each other. You know, um, there was, there was one guy that started feeding everybody. He started a little, uh, he was barbecuing or whatever and, and started, uh, helping feed people that were still there, either workers or people that, decided to stay there in the French quarter and that grew into more and more people coming in to help him. It grew into tents being set up for people to eat. It grew into, they moved over on canal street to the Hera or Hannah's casino casino, whatever that's called. And the, the big, I don't know, I guess it's like the valet drive through there that's covered. They had a setup there and they had outback coming in, bringing food and Texas roadhouse and all these different, places helping him out and all these volunteer workers there feeding everybody and, and feeding us too. Um, so, you know, there's, there's a lot of, there's a lot of good there, you know, and, and just understand that people are going, people will help out. You, you just, you know, it's kind of your demeanor, but there's a lot of people down there too, that you just really wouldn't want to be around and understand the situation, have sympathy for your fellow humans, understand what's going on. Um, take care of yourself, but number one, don't wait on the government to take care of you. Uh, it, with anything in life, do not wait on the government, local, federal, whatever, to take care of you. There was a guy at one point, there was an intersection there, 
down near the French Quarter, and somebody had spray. And this guy was a guy who had done it. He it spray painted "Drop H two O" or "Drop Dead," and he comes out and talks to us, and he was so pissed off because there was helicopters flying all over the place. There was helicopters everywhere out there. What they were doing, I, I don't know. They, some of them were doing rescues at some points, but other times, I I think they were just taking pictures or whatever. And he was upset because there were all these helicopters and nobody was coming in helping him or bringing them water or anything, which I understand to a point. But like we told him, if he would take his butt and if he had walked about five, six blocks to the north where they were handing out water, he would have had water. But here he was, his time and effort to spray paint real big in this intersection, drop H2O or drop dead. Well, come on now you, you know so so you are responsible for your well-being period end of story if you rely on the government you've already lost here here love it absolutely absolutely facts um let me talk to you about uh deploying as a soft civil affairs guy chad what was that like and break well, down so the mission and what you guys do and all that stuff for people that aren't familiar so civil affairs so c civil affairs is a big complicated animal uh and you have the active duty special operations side of it and then you have the reserve side of it and those are really two very different things the reserve side you've got like people where their full-time job is actually being a lawyer doctor whatever and they bring those skills into the towards the local populace of areas but long story short of civil affairs is we're supposed to be the commander's link to the civilian populace in, in an area of operations, right? But that, that takes on so many different forms depending on what country you're at, what the, we're in, what the mission is. You know, cause we've got civil affairs guys, soft civil affairs guys deployed all over the world, everywhere from the conflict zones, you know, Iraq, Syria, Afghanistan, all that, to Colombia, the Horn of Africa, you know, just in Asia, everywhere. We've got, we've got teams everywhere. So the mission is is very different you know um in a in a place like iraq afghanistan we're working directly with soft units with uh teams of green berets or seals or whoever whereas south america certain asian countries where we go there you're working out of the embassy you know and and and, and it and we have a what can be a very strategic mission so i so i say all that to say my everybody's experience in civil affairs can be very different and my experience was i really only got two deployments that were civil affairs deployments and one i did with uh with the task with jsoc uh, joint special operations command um and then the other one i did basically by myself as uh i was in kuwait and i, I worked a lo i worked with a uh, logistics unit there and was kind of their link so so deploying with them my experience was probably not the most pure civil affairs experience uh just because i was doing direct action missions and a lot of what my job was was to go on target and deal with the for lack of a better term the, the innocent civilians on the target you know once the hit was kind of over so Initially, I was just another rifle, you know, right? But but once once the action stopped, I was there to kind of take care of. I had a linguist with me, you know, an interpreter, and and I would deal with the the women and children and whatever males and all. And I really ended up being a jack of all trades because of my infantry background. The guys that I was working with, whether it be the Rangers or SEALs, because uh, I mainly worked with Rangers and SEALs. Um, more so with the rangers i helped them out with a lot of non-ca stuff i'll say um just because of my background but uh the seals i didn't i didn't help them just a, a whole lot they were different bunch i'll say um well what was the caliber of working with the the guys from jsuck like um you know it I was fortunate in the 82nd to be in, in a, in a company, an infantry company that was extremely high speed. We were, I was very blessed to be around a lot of really great dudes 
and work with a with high caliber officers, NCOs, everything. And and so going over to that environment, I honestly I saw a lot of things that were just disappointing. You know, honestly, um, some discipline things. Some, but the the biggest thing was money. You know, that I saw going over working with them. My thing was like money. Golly, these dudes have all the cool stuff. You know. Uh, and, and, and you, and we've always known that they're a big difference. They're much, you know, special operations, you're in a much smaller unit. So you just, you have more money to work with than, than large units. And, uh, I'll, I'll never, well, I'll never forget one of my first nights out with them going for a target building and, and, more or less having a having a target building illuminated for us from the sky uh with infrared with an infrared light basically and i was like what in the heck you know because prior to that my experience in the 82nd was you better be spot on with your coordinates and your map and compass and everything or you know gps we had gps is obviously but but you better be spot on with your coordinates to get to that that correct target house versus you've got somebody up there going Hey, here it is right here. Just come here. Like, <laughs> you know, s- stuff like that. And the amount of, uh, the amount of support that you have in, in a, in a unit like that with joint special operations command is just amazing. It truly is when they say, I don't remember what the number is, but you know, they'll typically say for every operator, there's a hundred support people or, or whatever the number is. It, it, it truly is. So when you see things like, like UBL being taken down. Yeah. There's somebody on target that made that shot and everything, but there's so many people working there. Maybe they're not pulling triggers and they don't have beards and tattoos and look cool, but they're working their butts off to get you to that, to that point, you know? So, uh, but it, it was, it was neat that, that, so back to the question of deploying the civil affairs, that, that was not as much of a civil affairs flavor, but when I deployed to Kuwait, that was more of a civil affairs flavor because that was my job really was to keep look, keep logistics moving um, is about the best way to describe it. I went around with my interpreter. I had a linguist who was an American citizen of Jordanian descent and he had lived, he had grew up in Kuwait as well. And I basically used him and his already established relationships by the time I got there and then made some more to, to help out with logistics. Uh, so to explain, I'll give you an example. So we had national guard units change out at the border of Iraq because all these supplies will come into Kuwait and then they get sent to Iraq or Afghanistan. Right? So we had the national guard units that were in charge of the border crossing there along with the Kuwaitis and Iraqis, they changed out. So, there was a signature card that had to be filled out properly for all this stuff, you know, like these full on trains of gas or, or truck supplies of gas to get across into Iraq. Well, that got backed up because they didn't have the right signature card. They had the signature card of the prior National Guard unit and not of the current one. So the Kuwaitis were saying, this is not right. We can't let these. Go. Well, you've got, you know, you're talking about there was something like a hundred and something trucks of fuel trying to get through into Iraq. So because we would go up there, say once a month and sit down and eat with them on the floor and crap and have rice and God knows whatever else was in there when I was eating it, um, and just be friends with them, the logistics people come over to my office and they say, Hey, can you help us out with this? Well, we call up there. I didn't call up there. My linguist calls up there because those guys didn't really speak much English and they go, Hey brother, what's going on, man? How, how can, how can we do, let us, okay. Can you do this for us? Can you, can you take the old signature card for, for two weeks and let us get this straightened out? Oh, okay, brother. Okay, brother. And the trucks are going through within two hours, you know? So it was basically that developing those relationships with those people, because it's just, it's like anywhere else in the world, relationships will get things done. Right. So I was friends with them. I was friends with people like the Kuwaiti police had a whole unit that was specifically for escorting American convoys. So I made friends with the the colonel that was the commander of them. He was a great dude. His wife would make me cakes and stuff like 
you know, it's those kind of relationships. It was really a lot of fun because I had to go around and be a nice guy to all these people. And, and, uh, and I got to train some Kuwaiti police along the way, um, which was, which was fun as well. I was, I was one of the few people, um, that had a get out of jail free card for carrying concealed around Kuwait, uh, because I was wearing civilian clothes and all that and, and traveling around Kuwait. So it was a, it was a really fun time. Yeah, it sounds like it, man. So, uh, uh, please like and share. We're just getting started with Chad this morning. Uh, hit that share button, share it to a group that maybe you're involved in that needs this information. Cause we're going to talk more about, uh, you know, the armed citizen. And right now, I guess is a good segue because I want to talk about your book, uh, tactical athlete. Uh, what do most people not understand about being fit for the fight, Chad? So I, I think one of the biggest things about being fit for the fight is that it's, it's an immediate need. You know what I mean? It's just like preparing. It's just, it's the same as, you know, doing dry fire and range prep and all this to be good with your gun for that moment of need. Well, you, you have to put in the work physically, exercising, eating right, all of those things to be able to be ready at that moment's no, notice to, to, uh, you know, respond. And, and so, you know, it's, it's, it's a constant and ongoing thing and it doesn't matter. You know, you can always do something no matter what injury you have or, or whatever, unless you're, you know, God bless him, Christopher Reeve in a, in a, in a wheelchair, paraplegic, you're paralyzed, whatever. There, I mean, there's always something you can do. So, um, you know, don't just be a person that carries a gun and, and thinks that you're, oh, I've, I've, I care about my self-defense. I've got a gun. Well, yeah, but if you weigh 400 pounds, you know, you better be able to draw that thing and shoot quick because, uh, you ain't gonna make it very far, you know, and you're probably gonna have a heart attack in the process under stress. Um, and, and people have different medical conditions and things that, that, that keep them from preparing as much as they would like to, or as much as some people might think, but I mean, you, you just, you got to work with what you've got. Right. And, and, uh, you've got to do some manner of exercise where, because, that stress level, the stress level of a gunfight is, is just almost indescribable at, at times, you know, and they mass, they, they last a matter of seconds. So you, you've got to be prepared. So anyway, long story short is it's a, it's a constant preparation, just like putting food in your stores, uh, going to the range and shooting all, all that stuff and diet as well. Yeah. You've got to, you've got to diet also, you know, not diet. I don't want to say diet, just, just nutrition. You know, one of the things I've been doing lately is trying to pay more attention to how I feel when I eat certain things. You know, sometimes you'll eat something and you just, you've got that draggy feeling afterwards. So I'm starting to try to pay as my body changes to, you know, 42 years is going to be 43 this, this summer, you know, as your body metabolism changes and all that, you gotta, I think it's important to pay attention to, cause there's all, there's all these fad diets and, you know, eat this, don't eat that. Well, really our bodies are all so different. What works for me may not work for you. So really paying attention to how your body reacts to what you're eating and what you're putting in it. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, I like your point initially, Chad, that, you know, these are all preparatory things. You know, this idea that uh, you're going to rise to the occasion and you're going to be some superhuman guy when the need arises, I think is an absolute fallacy that a lot of people have. I'm like, man, you're not being honest with yourself. If you have put in, going to get you so far. Yeah. And it really may, uh, it may hurt you more than help you. If you're unaccustomed to the effects of adrenaline, you know, like a jujitsu, if you're not used to getting crushed on the ground, you're going to become panicky and overwhelmed, you know, instead of being able to slow it down and methodically think through the problem. Uh, what yeah, do you, you think? Forget to breathe. <laughs> yeah, pass out. So, um, yeah, those are great points, man. Um, anything else about putting that book together? I know you've been a, a training folks for a long time in fitness. Uh, well, so I'll just I'll just say this: I I won't get real deep. So it's original strength for the tactical athlete, and basically what I did was my good buddy Tim Anderson, um we wrote the book together. We kind of wanted to, we wanted to take his original strength system and, and put my knowledge to it and, and kind of blend that system for a tactical athlete. 
without going to you, I, this could be a whole other show. So I'll, I'll just say go to go check out originalstrength.net. Uh, get on YouTube and, and just search original strength and you'll find a lot of stuff. But basically what original strength is, is there's, there's reset, there's five resets there. And, and, and it's, it teaches you to build strength the same way we build strength as babies. So rocking, rolling, head nods, all those kinds of things. And when we say strength, we're just talking about strength for everyday life. We're not talking about being able to be an offensive lineman in the NFL or, or the things that are going to make you look good on the beach in your thong or bikini or whatever you're wearing, your speedo rich. Um, so it's, it's, it's not about that. It's just about daily function. And, and one of my favorite parts about describing is in the book, you know, you've got a tree and you've got the trunk of the tree and all this and the roots. Well, original strength is really the roots. If you don't have a good root system on a tree, it's not going to stay up or be strong, right? So it's the same thing with you. You've got to develop your strength from the inside out kind of, and, and original strength will help you do that. So just get on YouTube, uh, look up some original strength videos, get in there, try some of the resets, uh, get the book, original strength for the tactical athlete, or there's there's several other, if you get on Amazon and search original strength, there's several titles out about it. Um, check it out. And, and it's stuff that you can do no matter whether I literally, I have taught an original strength workshop where a woman came in, she was in her at least seventies. She may have been towards 80 and she had her daughter help her in to the studio that day. And then by the time she left, just practicing these, these resets that I'm talking about, she was walking around doing high knees, touching her knees. And she was just, when she came in, she wasn't very happy to be there. When she left, she was smiling. So it's not just, you know, about being more mobile and physical and all that. It's, I, I don't want to get, I don't want to nerd out too much here, but exercise, I mean, dementia, I mean, every exer exercise has just an unlimited number of benefits. And I wish we would have pushed exercise and, and eating right way 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 more than we did during this pandemic because it's so beneficial yeah i totally agree with you man and um okay we're gonna uh, i'd encourage you just like chad did to go check that out actually we did this is round two with chad uh several years ago mike seeklander interviewed chad on our show the american warrior show so and i think that was mostly about original strength so if you want to learn more about that i'd encourage you to go back and listen to that show i want to shift gears a little bit chad and talk about you know the recent uh, unrest we have in America and specifically, you know, LeBron James a couple of weeks ago tweeted out a photograph of officer Nicholas Reardon. He was the police officer in Columbus, Ohio, who uh, fatally shot Micaiah Bryant, who was the 16 year old girl who was trying to stab several people. And uh, he tweeted out, you know, you're, uh, you're next and accountability and all this kind of stuff. I, I would just ask you, man, what, what, what will it take for people like LeBron James to understand? Uh, you know, first of all, bless his heart. You know, I mean, <laughs> <laughs> for I those of you that ain't from Tennessee, that that's a Southern thing, you know, to, yeah, bless his heart. Yeah. You know, I wish, I wish I could run a nonprofit that could go around and work in conjunction with law enforcement agencies and put civilians through shoot, don't shoot scenarios. And that would solve a lot. If you could take your average citizen, you know, specifically these people like LeBron James who, who, who want to, uh, you know, Monday morning quarterback and all this, and we all do to some extent, but, the people that want to be super critical like that. And especially people like him who have a platform, you know, that was kind of the biggest thing that got me about that is here is a guy who has an amazing platform, whether you like him or not, whether you agree with him or not, you, there's no, there's no disputing the fact that he has a large platform and which also means he had an opportunity there and he took the opportunity and went South with it when he could have really, shown people, Hey, let's, let's have some pause. Let's see what result, you know, like anyway, he, he, he could have, um, I'm not saying he had to come out in defense of that officer, but he could have at least said, Hey, let's have some restraint, you know, um, or, or, or whatever the case may be. But 
those kind of people that that do that i wish that i could take them these lawyers that that make tons of money off this kind of stuff all these people i wish i could take them and film them doing some of these shoot no shoot scenarios and see how well they do because they won't do well no they won't they do won't. well they won't i would i would love if if i if i had if i could pull the genie out of the ball right now i'd love to have a nonprofit that went around did that people and, and it would make money, and then I could pour that money back into law enforcement training. Yeah, I, I, I think that's what it's going to take. I mean, honestly, and I think there's almost like a civil affairs type role, uh, you know, to go out into the community and like, hey, here's what we're going to do. I'm going to take some of you community leaders. We're going to put you through the, the civilian police academy class. We're going to gear you up and let you do some role playing here in the parking lot. We're going to make it safe and all this stuff. And I think they'll come away with their eyes wide open. Like, what did you want them to do to save the life of that young girl that Micaiah had pinned to the hood of a car stabbing? What would you like done? Because, you know, the world we live in currently, there's really only one thing we can do. And again, it's like it's one of those things we've said a thousand times on the show. Violence. And deadly force is rarely, very rarely the answer. But when it is, unfortunately, as sad as it may be, it is the only answer, right? Exactly. I mean, you, the, in those moments when you, when you hesitate, when you fail to recognize that violence is the answer and you hesitate, well, then that's close to the end of your life, right? I mean, uh, you know, and, and I would love to put guys through those scenarios. And then I would sprinkle in scenarios that are real life. Some of the ones that people were so critical of and watch them react and react in the wrong way because they will. And, you know, go, Hey, see, do you see now? And, and you're not going to reach everyone that way. Right. But, but you'll get a lot of people at least for a minute and that you've got to be able to capture it on video because you got to get them in that moment because you know, as well as I do, a lot of those people that 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 get their stuff handed to them, thirty minutes later they're gonna be like, "Oh, well, yeah, well, you know, well, well, just like just like guys do when you're doing training with the military or anything. Well, you know, he might have got me, but you know, so yeah, yeah, yeah. That's a good point. And um, s- speaking of that, you know, uh, with the rise in mass shootings specifically that we've seen uh, since this administration took office, we've seen, I would say an uptick or it feels that way. Maybe the, maybe the data won't bear that out, but it certainly seems that the start of 2021 has has seen a rise in mass shootings. I would ask you, Chad, is gun control the answer? And if not, what is? You know, gun control is, is not the answer. It's more people control. I would say, it was funny. I saw a post on Twitter this morning that I almost responded to, and it was a, a female who posted a picture of the back of a, a Prius, oddly enough, and it had three stickers. It was like uh, pro, it said pro something, but the, the two main ones were uh, pro gun and pro life. You know, and this person had posted and said, do people truly not understand the irony of being both pro gun and pro life? Obviously, she's a person that is anti-gun and i'm thinking well could you then also say about the irony of having a pro-life sticker on a car because vehicles take more lives every day than guns do so i mean it's and, and and in that case is it the driver that's the problem or is it the car that's the problem when I take the same thing and apply it to guns, is the gun the problem or are the people the problems? And, you know, and I, and I really worry about this because I say I worry about it. I don't really worry about much, but, but mental health is the issue, right? I think, I think most of us could probably agree um, in a general, maybe I'm not, in, I'm not superbly educated on the issue, but I would say mental health is more the issue then then it's obviously more the issue than guns and i think mentally mental health wise we're getting worse in this country and the reason i say that is because we teach kids now so much about having anxiety and and depression and all this and teaching them is one thing but you but i i hear and see more kids today talking about how much anxiety and depression they have and 
I don't understand it. And, and that's, that's maybe a me problem. Maybe I just don't, you know, maybe I'm not sensitive enough or whatever, but I just, I don't know. I hear more kids talking about having anxiety today than, than, than ever before. It's almost like a buzzword. Oh, I've got anxiety. I've got anxiety. And I don't think they fully understand what true anxiety is. And, and I, I don't know. I just, I see more people thinking they have mental disorder and maybe they do. And, and maybe we did, we just didn't call it out. We dealt with it. So I think that's the problem is we're teaching, we're teaching more people that you have this problem, but not helping them deal with it as much. Um, whereas in our day, I feel like it was like, well, you know, whatever, whatever's going on, you got to deal with it. You know, it's kind of a slippery slope, but, but I do think mentally we're, we're, we're taking a downturn. We were more socially connected, I think, back then. I mean, you could say, well, we're rich, you know, they're socially connected. They got, look, look, they're all carrying this in their, in their pocket. They got their iPhone, they're, they're texting and social media all day long. Yeah, but that's, I think you would agree with me, man. That's not the same as human touch or human interaction, being in intimate spaces with each other, learning to read each other. I mean, when you're isolated at home, and then after a year or so of being stuck at home and not being able to go to school, play recess and these things. And the next thing you know, you got agoraphobia or whatever it is, fear of crowds and stuff like that. Well, it can happen that the, these young yeah. minds are in a developmental phase, you know? Yeah, that's part of it. I, I think I don't believe it'll ever come out. I, maybe somebody will do a Netflix documentary or whatever that'll help. But but the the numbers of how much bad I don't know how to put it, how much bad happened during the pandemic with the lockdowns between suicides and depression and people needing more pills and the economy. All, yeah. The economy, every, everything, all the bad that happened because of this extended lockdown, which I think was unnecessary at a point. Um, you know, I, there was so I, th I think there was probably so much more bad to come from that than good it did as far as with regard to the to to COVID. Yeah, you know it's it's one of those things. Uh, I, I I think I supported 15 days to to flatten the curve. You know that was the buzzword if if we remember that far back ago. 15 days to flatten the curve. Okay, I I get that mathematically that that makes sense to me if you look deep into the numbers. We need that. And then 15 days, here we are on the 500th day of 15 well, days. Yeah, Rich, and, and that's a good point because it, that's something, I mean, this ties all in, in together with what we've been talking about, but how how dangerous, when, when we look back at, at what's taken place, how dangerous was all this from the standpoint of the government and their control and, and things that they did? And look, I'm far from a, a tenfold hatter type guy, but but take a look at things like in Michigan, when governor, governor Whitmer was telling people they weren't allowed to even go outside, they weren't allowed to go outside and, and do like gardening and things. There was never any science. There was never anything that supported don't go outside period, even around your house, but they were putting out those kinds of orders. So when we sit here and we say, ah, well, that'll never happen in America. And, you know, and that goes back to gun control as well. We, 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 we certainly don't want more gun control because look, this is, you know, I hate to say it, but it's, you know, it may come to a time where you need to push back against, uh, uh, some, some government things like that. But when you're telling people stuff like that, and then, you know, you got governor Newsom out there and his whole thing was telling people not to leave. And there's several politicians that were telling people not to go anywhere and all this. Meanwhile, they're taking trips to Mexico, to Florida, to, to wherever so that should i i don't understand why it doesn't but that should wake people up to to hey uh the government's not they don't always have your best interest in mind and and there's a little bit of overreach going on and we we can't we can't be so blind as to think that some tyrannical type things might not happen here yeah i want to touch on that but before i do jason says internet enables communication but without genuine empathetic effect for the most part this is an important part of communication and socialization and yeah he, humans we're social animals man we have to have that and if we if not a whole lot of bad mental things can and will happen and to your point about the second amendment and gun control etc it depends on to me it depends on what you think 
that uh, the Second Amendment is for. If you think it's for hunting and sport shooting, <laughs> I think you got to put it in context. When those guys wrote the Second Amendment, they had just fought off tyranny. And then they say, we're going to put this in place as a check against tyranny. So there's, it's, it has zero to do with hunting and has everything to do with it. And so, again, a government that wants to take away that right is a government that I think I have to worry about. Yeah. And to, to Jason's point as well with the communication piece, I'm, I'm not real qualified to talk about it. And Rich, I know you've got a little bit of psychology in your background, but you know, I, I think that's affecting us as humans, that lack of uh, face-to-face communication. I know in, in civil affairs and, and I, I was an instructor there for four years in a civil affairs capacity there at the special warfare center. And one of the things we sat down and talked with, with all the entities that involve negotiations and face-to-face communication between the secret squirrel guys and all that. We talked to all these people that train that type of stuff. And we all sat down in a circle and talked about like, it's, it's kind of alarming how some of these younger folks aren't able to sit and communicate face-to-face very well. And a lot of it is because they're so used to now Zoom and all this stuff. This may be one good thing for the pandemic because this is still face-to-face communication. It's not maybe not the exact equivalent, but it's close versus, you know, texting and all. You know, if we text back and forth, we can sit there and I can write a text and I, or email and I can stop and think about it and I can back up and go, well, I didn't want to say this. Ah, let me say it like this. Ah, I didn't mean this. You can do all this editing and so you're having a very, uh, uh, you know, edited conversation back and forth, whereas face to face, you can't do that. And so kids or younger folks uh, who have spent a lot of time communicating electronically, they just they don't have the skills. And especially when you're talking about tense negotiations and, and things that we would put them through, you know, some people just lock up because they they they're not used to that, that back and forth and being able to think quickly and all. Yeah, and uh, on under your point there, as far as you know, seven percent of this human communication. I've I've researched this a little bit, and uh, I found two peer-reviewed studies that seem to indicate that seven percent of human communication is the actual words you speak. Another thirty-something percent is the actual tone that you use to convey information, mm-hmm. and then and then the rest of that fifty-something percent or what have you is your body language. So let, to your point about texting, Chad, I think it's good because all I can read is the words. So I have this large gap of how I'm going to interpret those words, you know, I'm and uh, everybody assumes tone. I mean, have someone read back a text to you and Sally said, nice pants you had on today. It's like, how do you know they yeah. meant it like that? S- Sally maybe didn't say that. Maybe Sally really did like your pants. No, she's always been a whatever. So it's, I think you're right. I think that, uh, and Jason Brown is right. You know, we're missing a big part of it. Yeah. And I have a degree in social psychology, so I'm probably more attuned to it than, than some people, but th- there's a great book. I wish I knew the authors. I think it's called the social animal and it's about, uh, human beings. It's a really good, uh, little book. I'll have to talk more about it on one of the shows coming up, but before I let you go, Chad, we've been on over an hour, man. I got several more questions I want to get to. One of the ones is given your background, all the things you've done, you know, training DOE guys and training folks at the uh, John F. Kennedy Special Warfare Center, Katrina, several combat deployments. What can the average American do, man, to make themselves harder to kill? Um, be a jack of all trades, master of none you know, I think is, uh, is, is a good approach. Um, find what do you mean by that? Where, uh, find out where you're deficient in your life as far as self-defense preparedness, all that, and just try to get it, just try to make small strides in, in those areas. So if you're not, if you haven't done, if you carry a handgun, but you haven't done a lot of training, just do a little bit of training. If you haven't had any medical training, you know, or even if you don't have any medical supplies, just get a little bit and do a little bit of training fitness, just do a little bit, start where you're at, you know, start where you're at and, and just make small strides in 
and making yourself more prepared. Uh, situational awareness, practice situational awareness. You know, every time you walk out of Walmart, look left and right, you know, not just for cars, but look at what's around you as you're on your way to your vehicle. As you're approaching your vehicle, just take a look around. If there's somebody that gives you the creeps, look them in the face and make them uncomfortable. Those little things, just start practicing little things. You don't, you know, the gun example, you don't need to go to the range and try to be Mike Seeklander. You know, you just need to be who you are, start where you're at and just try to get a little better. I think a lot of times where we, you know, and to being harder to kill just means having building your skill set. Right. That's basically what I'm saying here is building your skill set. But I'll, I'll kind of sum it up with this. A lot of times we fail at building those skills, I think, because we, we treat them a lot like people treat diets. You know, everybody on January 1st is going to start this new New Year, new me diet, right? And on December 31st, they're eating cakes and pies and McDonald's and all this. And they think that on January 1st, they're going to go completely keto, low carb or whatever. And from there it goes. And their, their diet lasts from January 1st to about January 3rd. And that's it. So, you know, if you're the kind of person that only goes to the range once every six months, well, let's try to make that, you know, once a month, you know, preferably once a week, maybe once every two weeks, but, you know, start where you're at, take where you're at. If you only go to the range once every six months, now go once every month, find a way to go once every two weeks, find a way to go once a week and just find your comfort zone within your lifestyle to improve medical training, grab, you know, we all don't have budgets that allow to just buy all this stuff. So with regard to increasing your self-defense, pick a month, go, okay, this month, I'm going to increase my, my fire defense capability in my house. I'm going to get some extinguishers, maybe a fire blanket, you know, whatever next month I'm going to get this, you know, create a plan. The analogy that I'll use to cap it off is the ladder, right? You know, at the bottom of the ladder is where you're at and at the top of the ladder on the roof of the house is where your goals are people think they're going to skip from the bottom rung all the way up to the roof of the house when in fact the 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 joy in it and what you should be doing is making sure you're hitting every rung on that ladder all the way up to get to that top and and don't even worry about the top just try to get to that next rung and improve your preparedness level by level no, oh, I love that, man. I love that. And I want to, you know, there's to your point about when you transition from your car to your, to let's say Walmart, you know, it's those in between spaces when you're at your home and you've got your doors locked and your security alarms on, you're pretty safe. When you get in your car, you're controlling the environment. You know, you've got speed and mobility and maneuverability on your side. So you're relatively safe as long as you're paying attention and you're you know, buckled in and everything. It's when you, and when you're inside the Walmart, you're relatively safe, but it's those transitional spaces that if you look at the FBI uniform crime statistics will show you that's where assaults happen. So if we know that already, why are we not really kind of keyed up in those areas? And what I mean by that is I want you to do something instead of looking at a sea of cars in a Walmart parking lot, look through the glass and you will see something shocking. You're going to see that 10%, 20% of those cars have people in them. What are those people doing in there? Uh, it could be nothing more than like me listening to a podcast because I don't want to go on Walmart and my wife's in there getting something for me. But it could be something nefarious. But you need to do more than just casually glance. Uh, would you agree with that? Yeah, absolutely. You've got to, you know, a lot of people think, well, you're being paranoid or whatever. No, you're not. And, and once you do it, it's a, it's a skill, right? And, and once you do it and practice it, you don't even notice it. I mean, I, I, can, I can go out today and I can go into town and I can go in to eat and I'll clear the room without ever having cleared the room in my mind. And it doesn't take a second thought, you know, just because I'll see the exits, all that stuff, because I've done it so much that you, you don't think about it. So it doesn't take away in the beginning, if you haven't done a lot of this, in the beginning, is it going to take some deliberate thought? Yes, but but it becomes second nature. And, and you're right. You see, I, uh, two days, two, three days ago, I sat in, it was Walmart parking lot. There was a guy that just gave me, gave me a vibe, man. He had a truck that was held together by duct tape and he was sitting there smoking and, and he was eyeballing my truck and I'm sitting in it. And 
so I just sat there, man, and I left the truck running and, and I didn't, he eventually got in and left. He was just smoking a cigarette, probably nothing. But that's another thing too, is in, in today's day and age, we're so afraid of offending people. I'm not like, I'll sit there and stare at you. Like if I get a little bit of a creepy vibe, you know, and then you turn out to be my best friend, well, I'll apologize. You know, I'll say, man, I'm sorry. I judged you. I thought you might've been somebody, you know, whatever. Like, Hey, sorry, but you know, you, you can't be afraid of, um, offending people or whatever if you're going to keep yourself safe especially females females don't be afraid if you're walking through a parking lot and and a dude's giving you a look down stare back at that dude don't smile at him but but stare back at that dude you know do whatever you can don't be afraid of hurting somebody's feelings screw their feelings keep yourself safe yeah i totally agree with that so uh yeah building those habits is a great thing you know my wife and i love to travel it's one of the favorite things we do and uh, Lisa will constantly be like, uh, Hey, we're going to go up here. We're going to take a lift. You know, if we're walking around a city we've never been in before we leave the Airbnb and we go down to the coffee shop and we go here and she's like, how did you know it was two blocks up and take a left to this place? How did you know that? I'm like, well, I've already been here. No, you haven't. I'm like, yeah, I have. I've went down Google, Google street maps and, and looked around, you know, I've, I did some research on, trip trip advisor where's the best restaurants and then i looked on google maps and i, I looked at the you know where we were going to go and if it was a shady neighborhood maybe i didn't go down that street i went two streets over and i looked up that but we have these resources we've never had before and it only takes a little bit of pre-planning and i you know to your point about everything's about pre-planning whether it's your fitness your dry fire training you know jujitsu preparedness, looking at rat, a route recon. You don't have to go to that city and do a reconnaissance these days. You can do it online, right? Yeah. The resources that we have today is amazing from everything to be able to change your own spare tire on your vehicle to your air filter in your vehicle, to your oil, to be able to work on it. Man, I, I renovated my house off YouTube, you know, and then things like Google maps with what you're talking about from a preparedness standpoint, we live at, it's what, it makes me so confused about people being able to do less and less these days. We live in a, one of the best times in, in eternity, as far as we have so much information. So it's probably too much really, but, but, uh, but yeah, utilize the tools that you have. Yeah. So Chad, uh, one of the, I think Gerald come up with this idea. He, he loves to know, and I think he's, he's onto something here. Best day, worst day. Can you share with us what your best day and worst day was? best day so yesterday um when you you because you you know it's no secret you send me these questions and i was looking at, at, at best day worst day and i usually try to go with my gut and within a minute i came up with the answer and your typical answers you know the day my daughter was born absolutely one of the best days of my life mm -hmm. the day I, I i met my wife got married to my wife you know um the first day i could hover a helicopter you know that's uh but so Memorial Day is coming up, right? Um, every every day is my best day. And and this is kind of my general. I hadn't really thought of it until this point as best day, but I try to live my life every day um, to, I don't know, to the fullest, I guess, you know, whatever. Like I, I've got a lot of friends that that aren't here today, not to not to get all down or dark. But, you know, we've got friends that didn't make it to this point. And I've, and I've got friends that you know, don't have the same kind of lifestyle because of things that have happened to them and everything that may be disabled or whatever. And I didn't have any of that. I didn't even get shot. Um, you know, nothing. So, it, and I'm still alive and I'm, I'm living a good life. I've got a great life right now. And so every day is my best day. And if it's not, then I'm, I'm failing those people that, that I left behind, you know what I mean? Like, and I didn't really leave behind, but you know what I'm saying with yeah. the people that, that aren't here anymore, it's my job to live my best day every day. So, so, so every day is my best day. There may be days where bad things happen. There may be things, you know, first world problems, you know, coffee maker goes kaput or whatever. And people think that those things are your best day. I think if you think of it that way, it really helps you with perspective because, how much happens to us that's truly bad. Now I know we have, you know, you lose a loved one, you know, there's, you know, financial issues happen. There's things that make days not great, but, but if you just put things in perspective and you're here, you're alive, 
every day is my best day. I like that answer. Nobody said that before, but I, I like that. Live every day as if it were your last, you know, uh, was it love like you're going to die tomorrow, learn like you're going to live forever. You know, there's some little euphemism like that. I like it. Uh, yeah, Tony said, Stoic quote too, memento more, whatever. Yeah. Uh, uh, remember one day you'll die. That's right. Memento more. Tony says another great show, gentlemen. Uh, when is Ed Morales part two? Yeah. Uh, if, if you were on Tuesday, you heard half of Ed's story about the 1986 FBI uh, Miami shootout that left, I believe, five agents, five agents wounded, two agents dead, and of course the uh, the killers, Platt and Maddox, dead. So we're uh, we're going to have Ed back on, I believe, next week. I'm calling him on Monday to schedule a good time for him. He's got some things that are up in the air, but, yeah, that's going to be a good one. Uh, let's see, Chad. So that's your your best day. What about your worst day, man? I, I honestly – I I don't know worst day. I thought about it, man, and I I don't know what my, what my worst day would be. I – I probably have an answer or two that I, I don't necessarily want to say on air, but, <laughs> but, uh, you know, I've, I've had some frightening times, but I don't know. I can't really stick anything out as having a worse day. I've, I've been in some fights where you, you know, you start to wonder, you know, I've been in some of those gunfights where you pick out a wound. You're like, golly, if I'm going to get hit, just let it be in the calf, you know, let, let, let me take one through the calf, you know, like, like I've, I've I'll get a cool limp out of it. Right. Yeah. Like, <laughs> Give me a purple heart and a, and a scar on my calf, you know, maybe, yeah. maybe a little bicep wound or something. I don't know, you know, a little forearm. I, I can handle that, you know, um, you know, but I just, I, I don't, I can't point to a worse day, man. And I know that's not what you're looking for, but uh, I just, I can't point to one day. That's, that's a worse day. I've had some bad ones, but I'm still alive, you know? Yeah, you are for now. Yeah. For now. <laughs> Flying helicopter, so we'll see. Exactly, dude. Hey, um, yeah, you you said something that got me going. I, I'll I'll think of it here in a second. But what are your thoughts? Rec- this is the final question, Chad. Then I'll, I'll let you get, jump in that helo and do your thing, man. But what are your thoughts concerning the you know the new administration, the pandemic, the pipeline, the economy? Where do you see this thing going in the coming weeks, months, and hell, maybe even the coming years? Well, and, and, and we'll, we'll talk, we'll talk about it, but, um, or we have talked about it and Mm -hmm. kind of some of it, but look, I'm, I'm not, I was more of a Trump supporter that, you know, I, I generally, I hate left, right, Republican, Democrat. I hate all that stuff. If anything, I'm probably conservative, libertarian type, but I hate those labels because I don't, I'm just. I just am who I am. I feel how I feel, think how I think, you know, that sort of thing. But with regard to the administration, one thing that frustrates me is I do think I was not a blind Trump supporter, but I did like a lot of what he did. And I do think there are things right now that affect the everyday American in their pocketbook. And that's the gas prices, lumber prices, you know, the gas shortage thing right now, man. But I do think Trump would, would be working on those things, um, you know, and, and helping us out with that versus this administration. I feel like they could care less about your everyday American and the things that are directly affecting us on a, on a daily basis. Um, but kind of a general overall answer is that it kind of, it kind of doesn't matter. You know, it, it matters, but it doesn't because you need to take care of yourself. I have this, this, uh, theory of your four walls, you need to take care of your own four walls. And so if we have a gas shortage, good, figure it out. If we have a pandemic, good, figure it out. It's It goes back to if you're waiting on the government to take care of you and all that, you've already lost. So no matter what happens, you are responsible for yourself and just realize that. Is all this stuff going on bad? Yeah. But if you're prepared, if you know what you need to do, then you're going to be all right. Does that make yeah. sense? No, that's totally right. And we talked about this before. If you're a prepared individual, then it's just another day for you. And everybody else can be freaking out, you know, and it's like, hey, man, uh, yeah, I've been it, thinking it, about this for a long time. Yeah, you know, it, it's it's 
you know, people, when Biden got elected or people thought Hillary was going to get elected, the sky was falling and all that. And I'm like, yeah, does it suck? Yeah, a little bit. But what what can you do? What can you do about that? Control what you can control. Can you, that president, especially one that's, look, he's clearly in a state of mental decline, right? I'm, that's not breaking news. You, yeah. you can't watch a video of Biden from four years ago and a video of him from, to you know, the recent days and tell me that's not a gentleman that, God bless him, is is in a state of mental decline. And so think about that. How how are how are the world powers and, and our foes looking at that when our leader is somebody that clearly has mental decline? How weak does that look? So do you need to think about those things? Yeah, because that should play into your preparedness plan or, or whatever you're doing. But in the end, it's it's you taking care of yourself and, and your circle of people. And and uh, American Warrior Society is a great place to help you out with that with that preparation. That's what I'm talking about. Hey, and you, if you want to read uh, not just Chad's book, but all the articles that Chad has written for the American Warrior Society, go to AmericanWarriorSociety.com and you will see several articles written by Chad. Uh, he's reviewed some gear for us. He's written on situational awareness. He's written on all kinds of stuff. So you can find out more about that for free American warrior society.com and uh, Chad, any closing thoughts, my brother? No, you know, it's just uh American war society has, has been great. I wish more people, more people would come to it and join. Um, you know, it, gosh, I can't even think, I think Mike brought me on, I think a year before it even launched. And that's how you and I met. Um, you know, because Mike was like, hey, I got this guy, Rich, he's going to be the operations guy, I link up with him. And I was, I had talked to Mike when I was an instructor and was kind of getting some teaching tips from him uh, as far as handgun stuff. Because, in, you know, in the military, you don't train handguns all that much. And in special operations, you you do a little more. So I was trying to get better with that. And, and I was also, I had a blog, I had a blog and was trying to write about guns and stuff, just throwing some darts at dartboards to see what sticks. And, um, and kind of brought us together and, and it's been great. And I've met so many great people. It's, it's a, it's a great community and it's, it's helped broaden my horizon and really been a resource for me as I have transitioned into retirement and, and don't have training available that I did while I was active duty. So I would encourage everyone, if anybody is listening and not a member of American Warriors Society, get behind that paywall and, uh, gosh, the value, I mean, how do you, you know, if you can't afford it, that's one thing, but how do you put a value on, on that kind of training? Yeah, I appreciate that kind words, man. And, uh, you know, it's, it's one of those things, uh, I'm often asked, you know, how do you get such great guests? I'm like, well, number one, most of these guests, uh, like 99% of them are members of the American Warriors Society that I've invited to come on the show, uh, or they're, close friends of mine and, and most of them are fit both categories. So, uh, yeah, we, we have a very good group of very serious people. And, uh, and, uh, we wanted to have a place where like, if you're a member of our close group, we have almost 800 people there and the discussions are civil, they're professional, they're thoughtful. And, uh, that's the kind of group. And if you can't abide by those rules, man, then, uh, you can go back to being a, a, a monkey throwing feces at each other in the YouTube comments, right? Yeah. Yeah. It's one of the few, it's one of the few places on social media that, that you can have, uh, you can have conversations and stuff and it's, it's civil. And especially when you're talking, when you're talking about, I've, I've really gotten away from a lot of tactical and firearms related stuff because I get tired of egos. I'm not an ego guy and I hate people that, uh, have huge egos other than you, Rich, but, um, <laughs> but, uh, but, uh, uh, yeah, American War Society is a place where you can discuss firearms and, and talk about events and stuff and, and people, you know, they disagree a little bit, but, but there's no, you know, you mention anything outside of American War Society. And I think everything today makes you either a racist or homophobic or misogynist or, or whatever, no matter what the topic is. So, um, yeah, there's none of that name calling stuff going on. Yeah. Jason's Jason says the best place to discuss this kind of content period. So thank you, Jason. Um, Chad, I've kept you on here for an hour and a half, brother. It's been an amazing show. I knew it would be. And, uh, 
I don't know, man. You got anything else you want to leave everybody with? No, man. I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna go fly now. I know Eric's probably, uh, Eric's probably chomping at the bit, and I'm ready to, I'm ready to get in there. Got some good weather looking, looking today, so I'm ready to go see if I can't crash a helicopter. <laughs> well, brother, be safe out there, and everybody else watching and listening today, be safe as well because the fight is coming. Be ready. <laughs>